Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is in the series on the Gospel in Galatians. This lesson is entitled, Freedom in Christ. You probably know that Paul likes to talk about freedom. So let's see if we can figure out what that's all about. This is lesson number 11 in that series for September 9 of 2017. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow yourselves with us? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for your presence among us, for your guidance as we study your word, for the Holy Spirit among us and, and, and the way in which he operates to bring us closer to you. May we, uh, as we study these lessons, uh, come to know you better is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we mentioned, this lesson is all about freedom. The freedom we have in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Um, how does it contrast with legalism, which Paul describes as a kind of slavery? How does it contrast with licentiousness? Um, people who think that they're just free to do any kind of sin they feel like doing. What is Christian freedom? What, is fr what does freedom mean to you in general? Is it freedom from something or freedom to do something? Um, freedom to choose? Now let me ask you a question, and while you're thinking about that, here's a, a tough one. Is Satan free? Yeah. Mm. It's not in the sense that Christ offers. Uh -huh. he, he had freedom at one time, but I think he mm -hmm. lost it when he turned to himself. Somebody who is a slave to their own passions and desires is not free. So He's, Satan has made the same choice so many times that it's almost not an option for him to change. Well, Hebrews, it says that uh, those who, f who fear of death are in lifelong bondage. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who's the one that's been fearing death for the longest? Would be Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, especially when we're teenagers, we think, well, freedom means you can do whatever you want to do, right? Is that the kind of freedom that uh, we're talking about here? There are two sides to freedom. Mm -hmm. There's a constructive side and a destructive side. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's look at the passage here and let's just uh, get a feel for what Paul was trying to say. He says, in my Bible, my Good News Bible, it t entitles this section, Preserve Your Freedom. It says, Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. Listen. I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, it means that Christ is of no use to you at all. Now, that might seem a little strange to some people. I mean, was Paul circumcised? Yes. yes. Was Peter circumcised? Yes. So, um, once more I warn any man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the whole law. Those of you who try to put, be put right with God by obeying the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You are outside God's grace. As for us, our hope is that God will put us right with Him, and this is what we wait for by the power of God's Spirit working through our faith. For when we are in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor the lack of it makes any difference at all. What matters is faith that works through love. You were doing well. You were doing so well, I'm sorry. Who made you stop obeying the truth? How did he persuade you? It was not done by God who calls you. It takes only a little yeast to make the whole batch of dough rise. What do you suppose he was talking about there? As they say. But I still feel confident about you. Our life and union with the Lord makes me confident that you will not take a different view and that the man who's upsetting you, whoever he is, will be punished by God. And you remember back in the first chapter of Galatians, Paul said, how many Gospels are there? Only one. 
Only one. And if anyone tries to give you a different gospel, do what? You should be condemned to hell, right? But as for me, my brothers and sisters, if I continue to preach that circumcision is necessary, why am I still being persecuted? If that were true, then my preaching about the cross of Christ would cause no trouble. I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way. Let them go on and castrate themselves. Wow, pretty strong language. As for you, my brothers and sisters, you are called to be free, but do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. For the whole law is summed up in one commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you act like wild animals, hurting and harming each other, then watch out or you will completely destroy one another. Wow. So, what do we learn from that passage? Well, pretty, it's pretty clear that Paul felt pretty strongly about the freedom issue, right? It also seems pretty clear that in his mind, at least, and we, we have to decide this for ourselves, the, what we sometimes call the ditch on one side of the road is just as bad as a ditch on the other side of the road. What do we mean by that? Well, those who think you can just do anything you want, we know about those, they, God struggled with people like that all through the Old Testament. On the other side of the road are those people who are so into legalism that you know, you, you, you hardly can do anything. You can hardly breathe, you know. So um, they believe, these people that, wanted, that had a very, con, very um, legalistic approach, that no matter how sinful, I'm sorry, this is the other group, no matter how sinful it may be, either they do not care about the consequences, they believe Christ will take care of it. So how did they get to that kind of point of view? Where did that come from? And where's the truth? Well, it comes from the flesh, from what our carnal desires want, and then we rationalize the information to yeah. fit whatever it is we want. So what kind of explanation did they give for that? Do you remember? There were two ways. Remember that, and we're going to get into this a little bit more, but let's just introduce the idea now. Primarily because of Plato and his kin, um, the Greeks believed that the body is made of three parts, the soul, the spirit, and the body. And they believed that the soul is somehow trapped in this body, and the soul is the only thing that can be saved, whereas the body is hopelessly evil. In fact, anything that you grab the table here, the table by definition is evil. My computer here, even if it's full of the Bible, is evil because you can touch it. So that was one side, uh, um, one, one approach. And so there's two ways you can take that. One way is to say, well, if the body is just completely evil, there's nothing you can do about it anyway, then it doesn't matter what you do. Commit any sin, whatever you want, because the body's evil, it's going to go to destruction anyway. So just preserve the spirit, preserve the soul inside the body. That's the only thing that really matters. And of course, on the other side, there are those who say, oh, we have to do everything just right because if we do anything wrong, then the soul and the body will be destroyed. So which side, which ditch do you prefer? Neither one. <laughs> <laughs> Neither one, I hope not. Well, does Christianity do away with the law? It depends how we look at the law. Yeah. Jesus said to the woman taken in adultery, in adultery, what did he say to her after all her accusers were gone? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Does that sound like he's throwing out the law? Look at John 5, 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple. Uh, this is talking about the man who had been uh, healed of his um, illnesses. Listen, you are well now, so stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And of course, 1 John 3, 4, we know, whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of the law, which is really would be more correct to say sin is rebelliousness, sin is lawlessness. Okay, so people have tried all sorts of things to avoid sin, um, earning, with the hope of earning themselves salvation. One of the most famous in ancient times was St. Simeon Stylites. 
What do we know about Simeon's stylites? It was on top of a pole. He thought, you know, I'm having such a hard time avoiding sin. What could I do to make it almost impossible to sin? Well, let me live. So he had a little platform on top of a pole. Initially, it was 10 feet tall. And there he was. And people uh, came around and, <clears throat> oh, look at the saint up there. You know, he sure can't sin up there on top of that pole. No way he could be selfish or, well, anyway, you, you got the picture. Do you think sin is just behavior? Well, no. there are a lot of people who think that. Well, it kind of, kind of, we seem to be talking about a compatible thing here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just worried about behavior when we talk about sin. Uh, maybe sin is something a little different than that. That um, More than that, maybe? Well, it may be just forgetting about God, doing it yourself. And, and you can even be the nicest person in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're still separated from God, it's still sin. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it that way... Um, Whatever is without faith is sin. Okay. Yeah. That's the Romans. Romans 14.23. Yeah. I used yeah. to... People used to tell me, I knew somebody that, that was just the nicest person in the world said he didn't believe in God, but he was the nicest person you ever th saw. And um, he, would, he would do anything for you. And um, okay, but is he still sinning? Well, the Lord looks on the heart. Yeah, exactly. We're the Lord looking would have at the to outside you know, that. So it could be one no, of those that well, in I Romans it says that uh, the Gentiles do instinctively the law. It could be that situation or he could just be very good at uh, uh, scratching people's, in other words, doing good things because he expects good things back in return. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it kind of Gordon. depends on the personality of the person, too. Yeah. Yeah. Gordon? So c to connect St. Simeon with current day, he was from Aleppo, Syria, which is so much in the news these days. Yes. Yeah. Well, how would, how would, what would his definition of sin be? It'd probably be behavior, wouldn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. So if you get up on a pole, well, how do you know if just wasting all your time up in the pole isn't sin? I guess, I guess doing nothing is, is okay. Well, but <laughs> I, I think of righteousness as not just being the absence of sin and wrongdoing, but the presence of, of goodness, the things, uh, doing good things. I think so God put us here to have living loving, growing relationships. Simon Stylites was not having living, loving, <laughs> growing relationships. He was cutting himself off from people. If you take sin as, if you believe that the definition of sin is the absence, I, I mean, of, of Christianity is the absence of sinning, then we can't, we're not going to find it on this side where the church is, but about a mile this direction, there's a whole group of people who are perfect saints. They never sin ever because that's where the cemetery is. <laughs> so, I mean, if you take that definition, you got some problems. Now I'm going to ask you the other side of that question. Could you be saved by keeping the law? No. Shall I read you a verse? Leviticus 18.5 Follow the practices and the laws that, I'm give, that I give you you will save your life by doing so. I am the Lord. That's what the Bible says, right? And there's a lot of other verses that say basically the same thing. But does that mean save you from doing harm to yourself or save you to eternal life? Well, here's another one. Ezekiel 18.9 Such a man obeys my commands and carefully keeps my laws. He is righteous and he will live, says the Sovereign Lord. Right? So then we get back to the definition of the law. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the problem with that proposition? Which proposition? Which you just well, that, that you can be saved by keeping the law. Well, we can't. We can't. Exactly. That's the problem. If we could, we could be saved. If we could live a perfect life like Jesus, we would be saved, right? But the problem is we can't. How can you... I just maybe wanted you problem, from the Bible. Maybe the problem why you can't is because the Lord isn't with you. 
So then wow. we're back again. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the, the, the problem is that you can't do it. Well, that's true. Absence of the Lord, that's for sure. Yeah. And maybe that's just saying what I was saying at the beginning here. Sin is just the absence of the Lord with mm. you. Okay. Well, someone has put it this way. It's, how do you feel about this? You cannot get out of this world without dying. You either die to self or you will die in your sins. Anybody willing to try that? No. It looks like, looks like any direction is death. Well, under certain circumstances, yes. Well, we're, we're already dead in our trespasses apart from Christ. So, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he who has the Son has life. So, Do you have to die to sin in order to have life? You have to recognize that you, you died or you, you are dead, in, uh -huh. in a sense. I mean, Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. You know, those who are lost, those who are, have not accepted God as their Savior are already dead. Well, what's the symbol and of... And they will... What's the symbol But we need to reckon ourselves as dead, as Paul says in Romans. Okay. Says. Well, when we're baptized, isn't there a symbol there? Yes. That says that we're di dying... Yes, exactly. ...and then rising again, but uh -huh. we're still alive. It's like the transition is a death, going from one to the other. Okay. Listen to the, yeah, go ahead. It, it's a death to the way we are born naturally. Yeah. The natural birth is selfish. We need to recognize that natural birth has a flawed birth. Therefore, we must be born again out of the Spirit of God, which is always about love. God is love. So that's the new birth. Well, don't we... <coughs> Go ahead. Don't we, um, don't we kind of have a, a natural understanding of what's decent as far as when we no, live? No, we, we get that from our parents. And yeah, there's some truth to that, but that's not the ultimate. No, I don't think so. If, if, yeah. if I was born on an island with somebody, I'd learn after a while how to get along with this other guy. Well, if I, probably. If there was two guys, it's, it's, it's something that kind of tells you how do you get along? Yeah, because and it's beneficial to you. Yeah. Well, that's true. It's still but selfish motive. That I, doesn't make it right. I yeah. kind of think that there's a natural way to do things wrong. There's a natural way to do things right. And we're always making a decision on that part. And we do need guidance to which way to go. Let me throw another wrench into this thing. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, so he's talking about us, Jesus himself became like them, or like us, and shared their human nature. He did this so that, through his death, he might destroy the devil, who has the power over death, and in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. What does that mean? Slaves because of their fear of death. He sets you free from that. People do what the law says to do because they want eternal life, which is a selfish approach to eternal life, therefore not God's way to eternal life. Think about the disciples. This is the, the way I always try to illustrate that point. They were Every one of them wanted to be the prime minister in the new kingdom they thought was being set up. And they were fighting each other and they was carrying on like this and so forth until crucifixion weekend. And what happened? Suddenly they realized after going through all that experience and sort of down the line a little bit, they realized, hey, there's life beyond this life. Even if, even if we die, that's not the end. There's a, God has an eternal plan for us. And they went out and, I mean, they, they got together and they confessed their sins to each other and they went out and they turned the world upside down. Because they realized that, you know, that old approach just doesn't work. And they weren't afraid of death at all. Do you think that they didn't appreciate that there was a, a life after death before the resurrection? Well, 
I, I trust the words of Ellen White there. She says they had an, I've forgotten the exact word she used, but a sort of ill-defined notion about that. Well, well, they were more concerned with the temporal here yeah. now, getting free of the Romans, setting up another kingdom, getting perks for yeah. themselves. Well, I think after the cross, it just dawned on them that what they thought Jesus was going to do, he wasn't going to do. So yeah. that just busted their paradigm, and they things had to be different. Yeah, but everybody, what did everybody expect? Everybody expected, okay, that he busted their paradigm. They're all going to fade into the woodwork. We're never going to hear from them again. That's not what happened. Well, I don't think so. I don't think so because, um, because Jesus was speaking more than that. That, that even if he left, don't you think the impression of his words would still be on him? Well, the spirit on was them? there. Right, it was, but th th that's that's exactly the point. The point is that they said, "Hey, the most important thing, we now have Jesus in our lives. We we realize that our relation to him, our relationship to him, is more important than life itself." And they went out with that kind of an attitude, and they turned the world upside down. And they had the spirit to guide them into all truth. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you're you're talking about you're talking about um, this temporal life is concerned. Well, because if you say initially. then life itself, well, then if you don't care about eternal life, well, then what's well, no. the use even no, doing? We're talking that? about the temporal life. Well, <laughs> it it hit my mind that way. So, yeah. well, <coughs> we the lesson is going to talk quite a bit about the fact that Christ died to pay for sin or to, to win us back to, to um, and, and Romans 3 is one of the clearest places, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 8, verse 3, what the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. Now, we've already suggested that the reason we can't be saved by keeping the law is because we can't keep the law. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. How does he do away with sin? By staying with them. <laughs> okay. By providing a way out of yeah. sin. Mm -hmm. and the only way out of sin is to love. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, by going all the way to the cross, showed that for him, love was more important than his own life. Yeah. And he wants us to adopt the same theology, shall we say? Yeah. And now we're coming back to the, how that relates to the law. Romans 13, verse 8, be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. So now we have a different definition of obeying the law. It's not trying to do a million things like the Pharisees did. It's what? It's obey, obeying the, love be, the law because we love, not obeying the law because the law says we have to do it. Yeah. That's the only difference, really. And he goes on to say in, in verse 10 here, Romans 13, if you love someone, you will never do, that, do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. So treating people decently is obeying the law. Well, love is a fulfillment of the law. If you're yeah, doing it for the right reason. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I a lot of just add another people. one there. You got to do it for the right reason. Yeah, that's a very important. So, what is the right reason? We can sit here and yeah. argue about that forever and ever. But yeah. if you just treat everybody well, and you, that's what you want to do, that's well, then right. what else can you do? Well, how far? How far? There are. How much farther can you go than that? There's a, there there are people out there who treat other everybody around them nicely yes. because they they want to be treated nice back. What's it's wrong with that? Well, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't going to get you salvation. Yeah. So you got to do it no matter what. No, you have to do it for the right reason. The right reason, and mm -hmm. it, that's the, the right it. reason. Let's, <laughs> let's, what is it? <laughs> let's put that, we're going to put the other side of the, of the coin on that one. To selfish human beings, this does not sound like freedom at all. How can service to others be considered freedom? Well, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him. Um, so, mm -hmm. go ahead. So we have, in, in the kingdom, we have these uh, opposing 
ideas of we're dead but we're alive, we're slaves but we're free, <coughs> we're, uh, uh, when we think of rewards, we think of what it, what's in it for us, but Jesus mm -hmm. said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Mm -hmm. So I think the rewards are, have more to do with our capacity to give. And so, so we have these, uh, where the natural man thinks of those things in terms of themselves, but in the kingdom we have to, we almost have to flip it over and look at it the opposite way. And the only secret to accomplishing that that I know of, and the one that seems to be spelled out pretty clearly by Paul particularly, is looking to Jesus and say, okay, I want to do it his way. I want to do it the way he did and see how, with the help of the Holy Spirit and so forth, how that can change us over a period of time. Um, I, don't, I don't see that there's any other way to do that. And it's not, not necessarily going to be easy. Um, God was able to turn, a lo a loose, uh, turn loose a group of former sinners in the new earth. He will be able to turn them loose uh, in the new earth where there are no jails, no police, no restrictions of any kind because they're completely free. And what, in what sense are they completely free? They never want to do anything that is wrong. Say so they will only, they just naturally choose to do what's right. Now that sounds, you know, so foreign to the average human approach that it seems impossible. Here's what it says in Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White, Page 668, paragraph 3. <clears throat> All true obedience, now that's what we're talking about, comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight and doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Now, I, I mean, if you just, you don't want to do anything except what Jesus did. And sin has become hateful to you, to us. It seems like that kind of a person would be ready for the kingdom, right? Well, it also sounds like you're, he's putting that instinct into us. Yeah. Is it that is. good? Yeah, absolutely. Inst I don't Instincts. know that I would use instinct. instinct. I know, I wouldn't we're, use it either, but it sounds like it. connecting to God's spirit, because he's the source mm -hmm. of all of these things. It's yeah, not but like you can take love and put it in a bowl. Where uh, is the decision part? still coming from we choose to to behold yeah. uh, god or we choose to behold the world we follow after the spirit or the flesh which we'll yeah but after you get rid of the world then where does it you, the, the you don't get rid of it like that the it, it gradually i'm you, talking about heaven okay yeah. we're in heaven the world is gone okay so now where is the decisions being made because it sounds like everything well, is being done for us because we have an instinct to do no, it. no, no, it, 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 what that means is that we only choose, every day we choose, we only choose to do what's right because that seems natural to us. It, well, it's, it's what we want to do. But yeah. that seems like there's only one direction. Well, if we're in heaven, there's only one direction. Well, That's I mean, if you, if you look back at Adam and Eve, did they have a choice? Well, yeah, but why did they go the way they did, you know? Uh, yeah. it, it seems so much, uh, so strange that they wouldn't have chose the right way. And yet so they, all they through eternity, there. there's going to be the choice for sin, there's going to be a choice for the good one, and we'll always choose this way. They're, Even though sin correct. will still be there, ready for us to choose, but we're and never going to choose that again. There's God, always, because there's always, there's always, as long as we don't, we're not omniscient, as God is omniscient, we're not going to know everything. So there's always some room to question, to doubt, but we don't follow those doubts and, and questions. We, uh, some people get uh, so good at finding errors in the Bible that they can almost uh, 
twist anything uh, the wrong way because they've honed that, that skill of, of yeah. looking for error. Uh, we won't have that. We will be uh, walking well, in let's, faith. Let's, let's, let's look at how this, let's bring this back to the law and see how it's related to the law. In the, in, I'm continuing, this is from Ellen White again, and this would be um, Signs of the Times, November 17, 1898. Just as Ellen White was finishing up writing The Desire of Ages. In the gift of God's dear Son, a definite view of his character has been given to the race that is never absent from his mind. His very heart has laid open in the royal law. That infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to that kind of people God would have composed his kingdom. It is only those who are obedient to all his commandments who will become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. These will be honored with a citizenship above, a life that measures with the life of God, a life without sorrow, pain, or death throughout eternal ages. And in another spot, she says, God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is a standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness, they have a place at the king's feast they have a right to join the blood-washed throng. And that's Christ's Optic Lessons, page 315. How, how much light do they have to be like in order to get over the threshold? You know, I'm going to leave that to the good Lord. No, it has, it, it has to, yes, not yes, that. yes, yes. Because that's the question that we argue all the time around this table. Well, and, We're and always we, talking about behavior. We're always talking about doing things a certain way. And we're trying to find what those are. Mm -hmm. So where is the point where our likeness, like Christ, is going to be enough to get us into heaven? Okay. Here, here's one explanation of that. If we, see the, we look at the life of Jesus, and we like what we see, and we say, I want to be like that. And every day we strive to be more and more and more like that. Is that your effort? You're just yeah, it is. Talk? Okay, it, it is an choice. effort. Your effort. It's his choice. Is it? Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't sound like a choice. You're sounding like you're talking about an effort. The way you do that is you allow the influence of the Holy Spirit, the influence of the life of Christ, into your life. You can't change yourself. Only God can change you. But it, but you have to. If you say no, He can't do it. You your effort is to say yes. That's that's your effort. And you and to, to, the way you do that is to take the time to read the Bible, to study, to think about God. That's the way you say yes. Okay, if you so do that. When, when have you crossed the threshold and the answer you've is, done it okay. enough that he'll open the gates of heaven and you can walk through? Okay, well, there's the thief on the cross who did it for a few minutes or maybe hours, thought that way. And then there's Moses and Abraham and Enoch and Job who did it for a lifetime. Yeah. So there is no threshold. It's just well, yes, there keeping, is. Your, keeping your eyes on Christ. Going in that direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which he's pointing, and you go that direction. He who has the Son has life. So yeah. you have already, uh, you're seated in heavenly places. You have already entered into life. Uh, that, that's the problem. We think of salvation as something down the road, and how much is it going to take? Uh, there, we'll get into probably in a couple of weeks here in, in chapter six about sowing to the flesh and to the spirit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here, here's the point. What we're really discussing is the difference between living a life of faith, which means looking at Jesus every day, relating to him, trying to become like him, or are we concerned about the sins we've committed and or we, we are committing or we have committed in the past? And the way I understand it, and this is my personal understanding, but I, I, it's weathered quite a few years with me, what happens to the real Christian is that every day he wants to be more and more like Jesus. And he forgets what's happened in the past. Because you know he can't change the past history anyway. 
So as he gets closer and closer to Jesus, at some point he will reach the place he doesn't even recognize when he crosses that point that he never wants to do anything except what Christ wants him to do. At that point, he's reached this goal, the one I just read about in Desire of Ages. Was the thief on the cross at that goal? Well, the thief on the cross had his hands nailed to the cross and his feet as well. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do anything. Therefore, the only thing he could do is to think a new way. And what is that new way of life? He saw in Jesus something he wanted for himself, someone who is all about others. Yeah, and I can see that. I can see what you're saying, but you're kind of still talking about yeah. some threshold that you've got to get over before, before you, the you people, can make it. The people who will be translated, they will reach that threshold. But that isn't necessarily us. No. In other words, you, There's a lot of people who go to heaven who will never reach that threshold. Right. So but in the middle of our past... A whole different group of people. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that, that's where we need to be headed. Especially today, because we are at the end of time. By yeah. <laughs> so, so some people are going to have more grace than others, because the yeah. Lord's got to wait for... Every one of us has the same threshold. grace. Every one of us has exactly the same well, grace. Well, it doesn't it's sound great. like it because... Yeah. because well, um, there's, but there's not a threshold for... Uh, you, you've already crossed the threshold if, you'd, if you've accepted Christ. There's no such yeah. thing as grace except we, ha we, we worship a gracious God. And He doesn't change. There's not more for this person and less for that other person unless you make your own choice against Him. Then, of course, that's a problem. But he's just as gracious any time, no matter how, what condition you're on, you're in, you turn around and look at him, he's just as gracious. In the middle of our passage, Galatians 3.13, it says these words. How do you understand these words? But, a be by, but by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who is hanged under a tree is under God's curse. Was Jesus under God's curse? Now we know back in Deuteronomy it says, you know, if anyone is crucified or hung on a tree, you need to take him down and bury him before the day is out because it's a, it's a curse to the land to have someone hanging on a tree. Is that what Paul is talking about here? Not sure? Is there anything scientific to that? <laughs> I'm asking the question. What is the price for our sins? Put it that way. And how did, how, how did he pay it? Who, 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 who does he pay it to? Is this a, a debt that God owes to Satan? Is it a debt that Jesus owes to the Father on our behalf? Uh, let, let me suggest another way of using the term uh, price or payment. When, we, when a soldier on the battlefield pays the ultimate price, we say he, it purchases our freedom. Mm -hmm. He's not paying it to somebody or, yeah. you know, as an exchange like we usually think of paying a price. He's doing what's necessary to accomplish the task. So I think if we think in terms of Jesus doing what was necessary, and there's plenty of scriptures that tell us yeah. he needed to die, and he said he, he, that's why he came. Um, whether we understand all of that or not, certainly not. Well, let, 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 me, let me put it in, in biblical terms. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says just in so many words, sin separates us from God. Okay. So, and, and Jesus said on the cross, you know, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's sin has separated, has separated Jesus from his Father. So if sin, the problem with sin is our separation from God, what would be the answer? It wouldn't be coming back to God? For one thing, sin is the manifestation yeah. that we are separated from God. Yeah. Our Why? behavior is, yeah. Yeah, that's the manifestation that we're not thinking right. <clears throat> Jesus went to the cross to show us that for all of us, we should put love ahead of our own life. Yeah. And if we understand that principle, and uh, every day of our life we should understand it a little more. And the more we understand the importance of love, the more we will want to be loving, and the less we will sin. Yeah. 
So, and, and to add to what you've just said, basically the principle of Satan's kingdom is selfishness. The principles of God's kingdom, is, the one principle of God's kingdom is love. So what motivates us? What, what principle do we act out every day in, in our behavior? It's love. And unfortunately, for most of us, it's a little bit of flip-flopping. We, we tend to be selfish sometimes, and we tend to be loving sometimes. And the, the goal ultimately is to get to the place where we're always loving. That's why we need to die daily to self. It's not just something that happens at baptism. It's, mm -hmm. it's a daily occurrence, and probably multiple times every day. If you took a thoroughly selfish person and said, guess what, I'm going to set you free to serve others, would they be attracted by that? No, no, because he wouldn't think it was freedom. No. And it looks like freedom is in the eye of, in the, eye of the beholder. Well, no. Well, isn't it true? People have different, idea, uh, different definitions. Mm -hmm. Of freedom? Yeah, but still free is to be we're, not we're restrained from doing what you want to do. Well, philosophers will tell wants. you there's no such thing as freedom because they don't know Christ, because they don't see that there are two sides, the constructive and the destructive side of freedom. And if we always choose the constructive side, we're on the side of love, whereas the destructive side, which is what the devil brought to, to the idea of the angels and humans, is that you know, it's a law of the survival of the fittest, and as long as we live under that law, we live under the law of our natural birth. And we need to pull away from that natural law. That's what Paul is telling us. Well, the, the, yeah. the thing is, you know, you talk about two different kinds of freedom. There's yes. a black freedom and a white freedom. Yes. But yet, when we get the question answers t asked to us, freedom, uh, there doesn't seem to be any differentiating that you're making as far as that goes. Freedom is problem. just to be yeah. unre not restricted to do anything. That's Let, the problem. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's take some more inspired words and see how they fit. There are some people who feel that we just need to grit our teeth, buckle down, and obey God's commandments. Can we do that? No. God Maybe does not... Huh? <laughs> Maybe for a little bit. Maybe. But that bit. doesn't save us, even yeah. if we do it. No. <laughs> God does not desire the type of obedience that springs from fear or obligation. Here are a couple of absolutely incredible quotations from Ellen White. Many people have not seen these quotations, and I think we need, to, we need to look at them very carefully. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey. When, a, when the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God, the essence of all righteousness. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. Because this will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Christ Topic Lessons, pages 97 and to the top of 98. Now, if I, if I go down this road and I find somebody that's been beaten up and he's laying on the f ground mm -hmm. bleeding, I have this inclination to... Run. No, to, oh. to just keep going, don't do anything. That's my inclination. Okay. okay. Now... I decide, though, by principle, mm -hmm. that I'm going to go help the guy, and I do. Mm -hmm. So am I condemned because I've done that? Because I have just made a decision against my it, what I really wanted to do. Okay. That's my natural tendency to what, what I'm going to do. She says, it's, it sounds like, that since I'm doing it by principle, it's no good. No, 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 that's not what she's saying. She it kind of, kind of looks like that. There's a difference between the mind and the heart. Mm -hmm. If you do it because your mind tells you to do it, you're doing it for yourself. If you no, do it no, because no, no. out of the goodness of your heart... No, 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 no. <laughs> but let me read the quotation. I know by principle 
principle. I know it's better to go help the guy. That's your heart speaking Even to that, the, yeah, no, it's in my brain. Because my heart wants to go this way. Okay. It well, wants in to other words, it. you haven't made it yet. We, we have a difference in what we call No, heart I have just done <laughs> what gonna, needed gonna, to be done. I'm going to answer your question. Here's another quotation. This Even fewer people have seen this one. A sullen submission to the will of the Father, that's you, will develop the character of a rebel. Not may, maybe, someday, will develop the character of a rebel. So long as you have that idea that you really don't want to do it. By such a one's service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Okay, so now you just told me that forget about helping the guy. No, that's not what I said. Because it won't make any difference. Because I don't really want to do it, but I'm doing it because of principle. If you're I, so I might as well just do what my heart says and just forget him. Do you think him. that Jesus didn't want to come down from that cross? Being human, he was tempted. Therefore, he had that thought. But his heart spoke louder than you're his thinking. You're making my point right there. You're making my no, but point. Because I didn't want to go and help this person. Just I it. wanted to, to just forget it. Now I want to, I'm going to help him because of principle now. Because exactly. I've, chosen the, I've chosen the principle over what my heart really wants to do. Over what your okay. instincts want to do. Instincts? Well, okay. it's still Mary, part, it could question. be the heart. Say this happens every other day for the next month and a half. By that the I end go of by the principle instead of my heart? Or you come across the same situation, yes. Every go day? By, principle. By, the end, by the end of that month and a half, are you doing it out of instinct, principle, or you've seen the results that it helps somebody and you would like to help somebody? Well, I do that through my mind, and that's why I'm sticking to the principle, even though my heart wants to go this way. Okay, that's a perfect principle of Phariseeism. Yes. Phariseeism, that's exact. They fasted yeah, but, two okay, days a week. Okay, I'll, I'll skip Phariseeism and don't help the guy and, and do exactly okay, and what you, my heart says. That's exactly. Okay. So that now, doesn't make sense. Talking, <laughs> now you're talking about the ditches in both the, on both sides of the road. You, <laughs> you're saying there's nothing in the middle, and we're saying... Now, you're, you're talking about principle, but in the previous quote it says, true obedience is the outworking of a principle within. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that could be God prompting you th uh, through what you call principle. So that Even I though I feel like I need to go this way, but I go on principle, it may still be the power of God doing yeah. that in me. Yeah. If, and if you do that, if you really d recognize the advantages of doing it that way, eventually you'll get to the place where that's what you want to do. Now, okay, and that's what we're talking about. As long as I hold on to my principle, e even if you s what you said is wrong, I'm still doing the right thing. Even if I say, <laughs> I, don't, I don't follow that logic. Okay, okay. okay. But the, the no, point, there's logic there. You the can rewind the tape and look at the it. The point again. is, we're we're running out of time here. <laughs> the point is, if if you still want to do what's wrong, you're not. It's not safe to admit you to heaven. That's the bottom line. And, and the Lord's going to kick me out? Yes, even, he, even if you know, I did he's not it by principle? Kick, not, he's not going to kick you out. He's just not going to let you in. It's, he's not it's not safe. In. It's not safe to let you in. It's what neither one. Loving God is You're that? kicking I yourself just, out. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, no, I just, he just said he's gonna, not going to let me go in. I just read it to you. It says, this is a sullen submission to the will of the Father. And you will become, sooner or later, you will be another Lucifer and you would cause problems in heaven and God just can't talk. You're adding something there. No, I'm that not. That isn't what yeah. it said. It's a solemn submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. Satan was the first rebel. Okay, so I'm going to, sorry guy, I'm going to leave you there because it won't make, make any difference. I'm going to be a, so a rebel anyway, so rebel I might as well just keep if, going if this you way. Think, if you think That's that not that, what it's saying. <laughs> if you think that it's impossible to give up that selfish approach, then you won't make it into the kingdom. I'm not. I'm not selfish. Yeah, I want to no, do this, but yeah. by principle, but I am going to go the, and do this. The fact that you want to do that means that you're still selfish. 
But but my principal had me do the right thing. Okay, and you might do that for a while. I'm but making a choice right here. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I'm making a choice. This I'm time. Not, we'll cover this, this time. time. I'm not going to go by the by what's an instinct of mine. I'm going to go by a principle that are isn't instincts, an instinct. Are instincts never changed? Well, I'm not saying that that it needs to be changed. I'm saying I'm not at saying this it needs point, to be changed. I'm saying at this point, I didn't feel like saving the guy. I wanted to keep going, but by principle, I turned and I saved the guy. And at the beginning, in the early in the Christian life, that's what you do. That's what you do. But if you if you continue to do that long enough, it will be it will become instinctive for you to do that. A habit, that's what a habit that you develop. Yeah, it's it's what we're talking about. That becomes a that's second nature saying, response not, to not you. That Basically, that one action, that yeah. one day. I still feel a problem with that for some reason. I don't. Base, know there's basically Hold there's it for the next still, lesson. We'll, we'll okay, okay, we'll keep going here. <laughs> basically, there's a ch choice. There's either selfish selfishness or there's love, and uh, I was going to take time to read uh, a portion from. Uh, Jonathan Edwards' m sermon long ago, but uh, if you want to read it, you're going to have to get our hand out. Go to our website at theox.org. But you know, he talked about sinners hanging by a spider web over hell, and the flames are licking at your feet, and so forth. And how does that make you feel? <laughs> Hot. Hot. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you felt it was your personal responsibility to appease the anger or wrath of such a God, how would you do it? Well, some people have sacrificed their children to appease God. Would you feel really good after you did that? Are you among the millions who have recognized the freeing actions of <coughs> Jesus Christ? Can you see the changes that have resulted from your relationship with Jesus Christ? Our lives should be continually growing more like Jesus. Remember that if you're still worshiping exactly the same mental picture of God that you worshiped one year ago, you're worshiping a graven image. In our lives, do we sometimes go back two steps forward and then one step back and so forth? Well, freedom is, it must be measured by outcomes. How do you ex exercise your freedom? What does it mean to you? Are you sure that you're free from the bondage of legalism? Um, <clears throat> often what happens to Christians is this, here's a sequence, one, a person becomes a Christian. They join a Christian group, they join a church, something like that. Two, that person feels very excited because they're, they're fairly soon, unfortunately, they, they uh, soon discover that they're living, they're living a bunch of, uh, among a bunch of people who are church members, but they, they don't seem to avoid sin any more than he is. So he starts looking around. He says, well, you know, look at brother so-and-so and brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so. They're not any better than I am. And so they start thinking, well, maybe if I'm lucky, God will grade on the curve. Is that the way it works? Well, a lot of people just get disgruntled at that point and drop out of the church completely. So God asks us not to compare ourselves with ourselves, but to look continually to Jesus. That's the only solution to that to, to our problems and that that solution is there because Jesus is our example so what are the dangers of legalism if we can just finish up with a few of those Paul was talking about circumcision why was that a, such a big issue in his day because submitting to a law does not save us to begin no. with it makes us better law-abiding people, but that doesn't make us um, better persons in, on the level of the heart. If you're saying, well, I'm going to earn my way to heaven by doing this, or even partly I'm going to earn my way to heaven by doing this, you're saying, God, God, God is not the kind of free, giving, loving God that we think he is. He sees a little bit like that. But if you accept the righteousness by faith that God offers, you recognize that you cannot do it for yourself, and you cannot at the same time be doing things to try to earn salvation. Trying to earn your way to heaven by whatever works, what you, what you might come up with is like throwing an anchor out behind you while you're trying to run a race. 
just how to show, but just to show how offended Paul felt by this form of legalism, he said that he hoped the promoters of circumcision would go all the way and castrate themselves. That's pretty, pretty serious talk. At least he wasn't asking to have somebody else to do it to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, citizenship always involves responsibilities. What are the responsibilities of being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Do we have to give up our legalistic, fear-driven religion? What did, Paul, what did John say? Perfect love does what? Cast out fear. Cast out all fear. Well, on the other hand, if you see the life and death of Jesus and recognize what God has done for you and freely admit that you cannot do it for yourself and then accept the freely offered righteousness, it will be a transforming experience for your life. Love will become the predominant motivator instead of selfishness. Gary, that's what we're talking about. This, of course, seems completely impossible to inherently selfish beings, but it is possible. This is a metamorphosis. A caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Are we motivated by love or by selfishness? Don't be fooled. The freedom that we have in Christ is not permission for self-indulgence. And that's very clear. If we read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you know that the last part of the last word in that expression is self-control. Now, what is are we controlled by the Spirit or are we controlled by ourselves? Well, if we have come to respect God and we've come to love God so completely that we don't want to do anything except His will, then what, what's going on here? Our natural tendencies have become godlike. Wouldn't you love to live in a community where everyone loves everybody else, serves everybody else, looking out for everybody else? Well, that's the kind of kingdom God wants us to live in. The problem is, if you want to live in a place like that, you have to be like that yourself. So how are we going to do this? Well, this, is a, this, this requires a practice of true agape love, and that's what you were talking about while we are still here on this earth. This is a kind of love which is based on principle and not emotion. It requires doing things for others long enough until we recognize that it is the greatest way to freedom and happiness. Hope you've enjoyed our discussion. You can see there's lots of aspects to this, and we're going to continue talking about this in our next lesson, the next two or three lessons in this series. Our kind and loving Father, you've seen that uh, we, still have, we still struggle with these ideas, and some of them seem almost impossible to accomplish, and yet you have promised that it is true, it is possible, as we become more and more like Jesus. Forgive us where we may have misunderstood, but help us to daily grow in that relationship so that we can have a part in your kingdom and live with you forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.